to say. Uh, I hope I'm audible. Yeah, a little louder, Harsha. <laughs> you are always so mild. <laughs> sure, sure, sir. So thank you, sir. Uh, I thank uh, AOS and Dr. Verma for this opportunity and for Sipla uh, to putting this uh, uh, program together. I'm talking on uh, detecting and tackling glaucoma progression, which is a vast subject uh, by itself. So I would at least try to touch upon the more important um, points uh, in this uh, topic. These are my financial disclosures, nothing particular of interest to today's uh, uh, discussion. We all know that uh, glaucoma progression refers to progressive death of retinal ganglion cells. And we detect this clinically using a lot of surrogate markers. Detecting progression clinically is one of the most challenging aspects of the glaucoma management. And going forwards, we will discuss some of the reasons for this. Methods to detect uh, glaucoma progression can be broadly classified into methods to detect structural progression and methods to detect functional progression. Functional prog progression is detected mostly predominantly on standard automatic perimetry. Structural progression in glaucoma refers to the progressive enlargement of the cup, progressive thinning of the neuroretinal rims, progressive thinning of the RNFL, et cetera. So structural progression can be detected using pictorial documentation of disc findings, which essentially are very good disc drawings which have become a challenge now in this era of uh, EMRs, but they are very useful in detecting uh, progressive changes. Serial photographs, once again, is a very good method of uh, detecting uh, glaucoma progression uh, along with imaging. So serial photographs uh, of the disc, good quality stereo images are uh, wonderful to detect progression, especially when you have uh, a case like this, which showed a uh, inferior rim excavation in 2006. In 2008, there was a disc hemorrhage and a developing RNFL defect inferiorly. And in 2019, there was uh, a notch inferiorly resolution of the disc hemorrhage, but an enlargement and probably a progressive thinning of the RNFL defect. So you can appreciate the more darker hue to the RNFL defect in 2019, which, um, which tells us that the, uh, the thinning is, is more progressive now. Methods to detect uh, progression on the standard automatic perimetry and on imaging um, have uh, similar uh, principles and can be discussed together. These are the methods. Let's go through some of the more commoner methods to detect progression, both on uh, perimetry and imaging. The first one is the clinical judgment method, which essentially means putting together the reports of uh, follow-up examination one next to the other and analyzing what the changes are uh, happening. Here is the visual field reports uh, of this patient, one done in 2002 and the other one done in 2005. So we can see that the mean deviation is worsening. The pattern standard deviation is worsening from four decibels to seven decibels. And the threshold sensitivities also in the superior hemifield show um, reduction in this particular sector. So this is how we look at the clinical judgment method. Um, however, this is a subjective evaluation. And the same thing applies to the imaging method also. Here is the OCT reports, uh, one done in 2013 and one done in 2015. And we can look at the RNFL thickness in the quadrants, in the clock R sections, and notice that the RNFL thickness in these smaller regions are reducing during this time, both in the superior and the inferior pose. However, this is quite time consuming. It takes a lot of time. We'll have to give careful attention to each of the smaller details here. And more importantly, uh, we need to know what's the test free test variability of these measurements. And we, we need to account for this to come out with clinically relevant information out of this method. That's the reason we now have more analytical methods to detect progression. The first one is the trend analysis. So in the trend analysis, uh, the change in the parameter over time is, is analyzed and the slope is provided. This gives us, this tells us um, at what rate a particular parameter is changing over time. And uh, that can be used 
um, to decipher whether the change in the parameter is happening at a rapid place, space, or it's at a slow pace. On the visual field, trend analysis is used for the global indices like mean deviation, pattern standard deviation, and the VFI. So here in these plots, the MD here, the PSD here, and the VFI here are plotted uh, over time at each different visits. And the change happening in each of these parameters is provided as a slope here. As you can see, the MD slope is minus 0.8 decibel per year, and the slope is significant. The more popular one nowadays is the VFI slope. However, these global indices on visual fields have their own limitations. Um, cataract and other uh, causes of generalized depression affect the mean deviation. PSD artifactually improves um, in advanced stages of the disease. And VFI also has limitations. It's less sensitive than mean deviation in early diseases. And the linearity assumption of VFI is broken in advanced stages. The trend-based analysis with OCT also evaluates the average parameters, the average thickness measurements, be it the RNFL or the GCC thicknesses over time, and the rate of change of these parameters are given over time with the, their clinical significance, with their statistical significance. Here is an example which shows both the RNFL and the GCC thinning with time um, and the, the, both these uh, changes have been statistically significant. The trend analysis also has its own set of limitations. It requires multiple examinations. And we essentially don't know what's the magnitude of, of change that is significant. Though it's generally believed that any change which is happening over and above the age-related change can be considered clinically relevant. Also, the, the linearity assumption may be broken, and this trend analysis is greatly affected by uh, the outliers um, because most of these uh, trend analysis use the linear function of time. Here is an example where the rate of progression, which is minus 0.7% per year on VFI, has almost doubled when the outliers have been removed in the analysis. So this is something which we need to be um, uh, mindful of and remove the outliers, unreliable examinations from the trend analysis. Using global indices, once again, has a lot of uh, issues. We know that glaucoma progression happens in more localized areas. And using global indices, global parameters, masks the, the changes happening in focal areas. Event analysis is where uh, the follow-up examinations are compared with baseline examinations and a change in the parameter of certain magnitude is considered as a change uh, based on uh, predefined thresholds and definitions. The event analysis on visual field is based out of the EMGT trial criteria where a point which has changed in its threshold sensitivity um, by a magnitude over and above the test rate-test um, variability of that point seen in stable glaucomas is considered as progression. Here is an example of um, a, an, an eye which has been stable over time. As you see, there is this message coming out from the event analysis, which is it says no progression detected over time. And this is an example where there is progression detected. Uh, you see that there is likely progression, and you also see a trend analysis, which is more obvious. The limitations of visual fields uh, for detecting progression um, is primarily uh, from the fluctuations which arise out of these thresholds, especially uh, in um, diseased uh, points or diseased areas. Here is a good example of it. We have the this uh, glaucoma patient whose baselines are done in 2003, and subsequently a progression was detected on event analysis in 2005. There is likely progression, but what happens next is interesting. In 2007 and 2008, the fields are very similar to the baseline examinations. There is no progression. Once again, over time, in 2010, subsequently 2013, 14, once again it says that there is likely progression. So this is the fluctuation which we see regularly on visual field uh, thresholds, uh, and this is one of the limitations. 
the event-based progression uh, analysis on OCT um, is, is also on the similar methods. There are two analysis which happens uh, on the OCT, the serous OCT at least. One is the RNFL thickness change map where uh, the, uh, the change in the RNFL thickness, the reduction in the RNFL thickness at uh, superpixel levels are analyzed. And if a cluster of 20 superpixels show a reduction in RNFL thickness greater than that seen, uh, greater than the test retest variability, that's called as progression. So this happens both on the RNFL and the GCC maps. The other event analysis in the OCT happens on the TSNIP profile. And if a reduction in the RNFL thickness is seen in a 20 degree sector, that's called uh, a progression on the TSNIP profile. So most of these uh, reports um, combine both the trend and the event analysis and give the analysis to us. Um, we know that the event analysis is um, more sensitive in picking up progression and also picks up progression earlier than the trend analysis. However, the trend analysis also has an advantage that um, it can be projected to the future. So uh, it has a prediction um, uh, advantage. So you know that if the, the same trend continues, what would be the likely um, parameter value that would, that would be reached in five years or 10 years down the line? A couple of quick examples here. So this uh, patient followed up uh, uh, yearly with the disc photographs. I would just want to highlight the 2016 and the 2019 disc photographs here. As you can see, the inferior RNFL defect is enlarging. The upper border of the RNFL, which is here in 2016, has moved up closer to the macula in 2019. The visual fields also show a correlating enlargement of the nasal defect also show a correlating enlargement of the paraphobial scotoma and the 10 2 fields. And the OCT also shows a correlating um, progressive RNFL thinning and the GCIPL thinning here. So this is an example where all the methods are correlating with each other very well, which is easy to um, confirm the presence of progression. In this example, uh, so the disc shows an inferior notch and a superior RNFL defect, very difficult to uh, analyze any change with the disc, disc photographs uh, in this patient. Visual fields remain stable and the RNFL thickness also remains quite stable over these three time points. However, the GCC maps show that there is an enlargement in the zone of GCC thinning. So in this example, the GCC maps show a possible progression while the visual fields and the RNFL maps don't agree with it. So these are the common situations. In this example, you see a normal looking disc in 2015, developed an inferior rim excavation in 2016, subsequently a disc hemorrhage, an RNFL defect, which kept on progressing. So this was correlated very well with the RNFL map and the GCC maps. Uh, however, when, when, when we can put everything together, what we see here is that the, the progression is picked up earlier by the GCIPL maps. GCIPL maps are showing a, a progressive thinning in 2016. The RNFL maps are showing a progressive thinning in 2018. And the visual fields are showing a progression only in 2019 and 2020. Um, these are 24-2 fields, by the way. So uh, there's always a debate on visual fields versus imaging for the early and accurate det detection of progression. That's once again a big chapter in itself. However, the important thing for me to stress here is one factor which decides which test you choose for detection of progression is the severity of the disease. In early and moderate severity of disease, um, imaging methods probably are better to pick up change. And in moderate to advanced disease, visual fields are better to uh, detect change. The primary reason for that is the floor effect. We alluded to this earlier also. Um, the floor effect is uh, seen on the structural measurements. We have this example where the visual field is showing an obvious progression. However, the RNFL maps are not showing any change because the structural measurements reach a floor at certain uh, level of uh, disease severity. So to confirm progression, we need good quality test, 
good reliability indices of visual fields. And before you confirm progression, you need to make sure that the relation of the progression locations on your tests are in, in relation to the original defect, because that's how commonly glaucoma progresses. And you also have to look for accompanying clinical evidence before you make the decision of progression and whenever in doubt, repeat the test. So I'll, I'll briefly go into the tackling progression part. Uh, so before that, we need to remind ourselves that the aim of glaucoma management is to slow down the progression of the disease to an extent that minimizes the likelihood glau of glaucoma-related visual disability during the lifetime of the patient. What this means is that uh, it, it's perfectly fine if you don't change a treatment, even in the presence of confirmed progression, if you feel that during the patient's lifetime, this amount of progression is not likely to affect the visual uh, quality of life or would cause visual disability. Once you do that, and once you know that this is a progression which is likely to cause visual disability, uh, disability to the patient, we move to the next steps. When you have confirmed progression, the first simplest thing we do is to see what the office IOPs are. Are they higher than the target levels? Are they close to the target levels? If they are higher than the target levels, um, we need augmentation of therapy. Before that, we need to check for treatment compliance. Um, this is what we assume, but we'll have to uh, carefully check the compliance, whether the patient's using the medicines appropriately. Always repeat gonioscopy whenever the clinical picture changes, uh, especially in the situation of an angle closure in a previously diagnosed open angle glaucoma eye. If the IOP, office IOP is at the target level, the first thing is to rule out other pathologies. We saw vein occlusions, we saw uh, retinal scars, um, it can be ARMDs, which can mimic glaucoma progression. We need to rule them out. Once again, even if the, the IOPs are at the target level, check for the compliance because there can be spikes happening in the non-office hours. Repeat gonioscopy once again because the angle closure components can cause IOP spikes in the non-office hours and then do the diagonal IOP checks. We, we heard about all these other uncommon causes for progression, be it sleep apnea, water detoxification, yoga postures, all, all these can cause uh, spikes in intraocular pressure during the, during the period, of, um, period of the performance of these activities. Then we also heard about reduced ocular perfusion and neural imaging by previous speakers. Uh, how do we treat them? The only uh, option or the, 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 uh, the most successful option we have to tackle progression is to augment therapy. In addition to it, uh, I, I, I also in some cases advise regular physical exercise. Uh, I, always, I also uh, advise to avoid overeating a method of uh, caloric restriction. And some activity to reduce stress can be meditation, can be um, time away from, say, WhatsApp, time away from spouse if that reduces stress, so etc. So augmenting therapy, the simple things first, if the patient is on a single AGM like a beta blocker or an alpha agonist, we know from sleep lab experiments that the nocturnal IOP reduction is, is not very favorable with them and so shift them to PGA. If the patient is already on a PGA and in addition to PGA is on either a beta blocker or, or on an alpha agonist, shift to a PGA with carbonic anhydrase inhibitors because that provides an additional reduction in the intraocular pressure during the nocturnal hours. If the patient is on maximum medical therapy, consider a filtering surgery. And if the patient has uh, accompanying angle closure with cataract, you can consider cataract surgery. So, um, a tackling progression is once again a very huge topic and it's so much individual as we individualized as we saw with previous case examples. So to summarize, detecting progression is one of the most challenging aspects. Uh, no one method to detect progression is complete. So you may have to use information from multiple tests sometimes. Uh, and then the therapeutic changes are required in patients who are likely to develop visual disability and not in all of them. 